In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The rich man had a lot of things that Lazarus didn't have. He had fine linen clothes in purple, and he had sumptuous feasts every day. But sumptuous feasts doesn't quite capture it even. They weren't just good food, but they were kill the fattened calf kind of feasts every day. Meanwhile, poor Lazarus had sores and a spot outside the rich man's home to beg. Other than the neighborhood dogs that ate the neighbor's trash, he didn't have anything. According to a human viewpoint, the rich man had more than enough of everything, and meanwhile, Lazarus didn't have nearly enough of anything. But when both these men died, everything changed. Then all the rich man had was terrible thirst, as the flames of Hades burned around him. Meanwhile, poor Lazarus had been carried to Abram's side by the angels. But even then, the rich man thought it was all about himself. He arrogantly asked if Abram would send Lazarus to dip his finger in water, come down to the torment where he was, so that he could lick the water off of Lazarus's finger. Talk about something humiliating and degrading and a little bit gross. When Abraham tells him that there's a chasm between them that Lazarus couldn't pass through, it slows down the rich man's request. But on, his other hand, on the other hand, Lazarus was next to Abraham. That phrase at his side that is used to describe Lazarus after his death implies that they were reclining together at a feast where oftentimes in the first century people would lie down uh, kind of belly to back uh, as they would eat with their right hand. And so this implies that now Lazarus has a sumptuous feast in his own way, but still the rich man seemed not, didn't seem to get it. He asked that Lazarus would be sent to his brothers so that they, seeing somebody raised from the dead, wouldn't, would repent and believe and wouldn't be sent into torment like he was. But Abraham just told him that if they had Moses, who wrote the first five books of the Bible, along with the prophets, and they didn't believe them, then they wouldn't believe somebody raised from the dead either. It's an odd story for Jesus to tell, though, isn't it? It focuses on the idea of having enough. In this earthly life, obviously, the rich man had more than enough. And Lazarus didn't have nearly enough at all. But after his death, the rich man didn't have enough of anything for his standards, while Lazarus was enjoying the comfort of being a child of Abraham. Lazarus finally had enough. But this story that Jesus tells raises the question, how much is enough for you? A lot of times, this raises the question of stuff. Do you need, or even want, sumptuous feasts every day? A lot of you might say, we're just salt of the earth people, pastor. A nice steak and potato meal every once in a while and we're good, but we don't need we don't need something too opulent or something too over the top. When it comes to houses and cars, you are content with what you have for the most part. But when it comes to God's attention and God's care for you, things become a little bit more complicated. God moved poor Lazarus, who didn't have enough, to the side of Abraham. And the man who had more than he'd ever needed was stripped of everything that he had. In the rules of a world that loves the status quo and the way that things are, this reversal seems ridiculous. This is the exact opposite of the way that we expect things to go because in the world that we live in, the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, and that's what we know all too well. But the Lord stands this on its head, lifting up the poor like Lazarus and lowering the rich and the over-the-top, like the rich man. So where do you stand? 
What do you have to count on? And do you think you have enough, not just before others, but before God? Your possessions don't count. If you think that anything else sets you apart before the Lord, be careful. He's the one who lifts up the lowly while low condemning the rich and well supplied. Before the Lord your God, what do you have? Do you keep the Ten Commandments perfectly? If you're like me, not hardly. Do you pray the way that your Lord Jesus teaches you to pray? Or like Paul says, to pray without ceasing? Uh-oh. Do you have a perfect faith without any doubts whatsoever? Do you have a sumptuous feast of faith? Probably not. Instead, you're more like poor Lazarus outside the gate, begging for the mercy of God. When it comes to the perfection of keeping God's word and God's commands, earnestness in prayer, and a lack of doubt, you don't have anything to be proud of. Then again, neither did poor Lazarus. Proud would not define him at all. There he was, a beggar being licked by the neighborhood dogs. There is no pride there. What you do have in common with Lazarus is the grace of God, the mercy that he pours forth on you. But where does this mercy come from? Well, it sure doesn't come from the marching orders that the rich man gives when he asks for that finger dipped in water or even in Lazarus returning from the dead to his brothers. You have the hope of Jesus resurrected from the dead. This was no Lazarus being sent back just to warn five guys. No, this is God in the flesh sent for you, not just to say, straighten up and fly right, guys. No, instead the perfect son of God comes into the flesh saying, you haven't straightened up, you haven't flown right, you have doubts and fears, you've disobeyed the word of God, and yet for you, even you beggarly Christians, I suffer and die and rise again from the dead. You have the blood of Jesus covering your sins. You have the grace of God poured out for you. You have the mercy not of Lazarus leaving the side of Abraham, but of the one and only Son of God descending from heaven to suffer and die for you in a terrible, horrible crucifixion. And you thought that having water licked off of Lazarus' finger was degrading. The grace of God has been shown to you. God doesn't just look at those who seem to have it all together and reg regard them as the ones who deserve his love. He pours out his love on the weak and the imperfect, on those who don't have it all together, to those who are poor in spirit. The Lord lifts you up and he gives you the promise that you have a place with Abraham and Lazarus in the world to come. Believe this, because it is God's truth for you. Amen.